All right, so for week three, uh, we've taken two weeks to set ourselves up with the command prompt and learning a little bit about what Cordova is and the API, and we were creating icons last time. Well, now we can start to bring in our work from last month. So you should have a copy of handout seven. Let's look at handout seven, and then we'll do what's there. Handout number seven, Campo 7, import web app in app browser. Let's jump over briefly instead first to page two of handout seven. We'll do page one in a moment, but if we go over to page two, well actually page, it's between page one and page two. The part that starts with debugging with Cordova browser and Google Chrome, and then on page two it goes on to debugging with a real device and Google Chrome. So here in this handout, I have the part that explains we'll be able to debug our apps in Google Chrome pretty quickly, pretty easily, um, because our project is still an HTML project, isn't it? It's still based on the web technologies from last month. So using Google Chrome will still allow us to see console output and any other JavaScript errors and such. Uh, I have listed here, if you use Taco Platform at browser, you can use the Google Chrome web browser for some debugging tasks in your command prompt here. If you got a copy of my work from the network folder, then we will type the usual command here, taco run browser. Now it's taco emulate browser or taco run browser. Run is just faster to type, but they both do the same thing. So go ahead and type taco run browser. That'll process it and load it up in the web browser. We've uh, seen this a little bit before, but I really want to explain why this is so valuable. This is basically for debugging purposes. Even when I would create an, a project for a client or for myself, it would be an Android project or an iPhone project, but I still add the browser template so that I can open it in the web browser. It's opening up. It kind of looks broken for a moment. Don't worry about that. I'll explain. But here I've got, okay, taco run browser. If you get a message about firewall, allow it. If you get a message about not seeing, not being able to save files, click OK. If you get a message about storing files, click allow. OK. So we, we still have the Cordova mascot, but this is not what we edited on Thursday. On Thursday, that was the apps icon and the apps splash screen. This is the index HTML file, which we really haven't touched yet. In this project, we've edited the config XML file, and we've edited the icons. So when I first loaded this up a moment ago, there was like a broken icon or a broken image um, icon. That was the splash screen that was trying to display, and it didn't properly display. And that's OK. It's not going to load up properly in the web browser. But we've tested it on the real and virtual devices, and it works. But what my handout is saying is, you can debug many aspects of your app here in the browser. So here in Google Chrome, if you press F12 on the keyboard, that'll bring up your developer's console. And we will use the element inspector later when we have to customize our project. If we're over on the console view, this is output that we get, and we get some red, scary-looking output, but for the moment, we don't have to worry about it. This says something about uncaught module Cordova plugin status bar already defined. Okay, don't worry. Adding proxy for battery camera, etc. We had added all of these features to our app to be able to access the battery, the compass, uh, capture, etc. So the web browser is creating a proxy, like an approximation of what we can do in the browser. Something about persistent FS quota, I believe that's file system, so we're able to save data. Okay, great. And we got a couple more error messages. Fail to load resource, etc., etc. Fail to load fav icon. Well, that doesn't matter 
the fav icon doesn't matter for an app. So I'm not worried about that error. And then the next one is an error that it could not load the splash screen. Again, I won't worry about it. The web browser can't quite load the splash screen, apparently. I'm not worried about it. I'll be able to see the splash screen on my real device. So that's some output that I get there. My handout says, OK. So we're in the browser, F12, to see your console output in the debugging tool switched to console view. That's what we did. On that row of tabs, click the second icon from the left and that's the toggle device toolbar. So right here, there's a strip of, of icons there. Toggle device toolbar, click that. This rearranges your screen a little bit, sort of like a mobile device. At the top it says it's in responsive mode and you can set various dimensions. In the mobile view at top left, select the device. So instead of just responsive, I can go here and select, okay, show this to me sort of like a Galaxy S5. Show this to me like an iPhone, like an iPad. If I select S5, the screen changes a bit to represent that particular device. And actually, this is represent, this would represent the. Um, this would use the user agent of a real Android device. Remember we did the, what's it called, the um, user agent detection on the last days of class last month. This will behave like an Android device if we try to go to another website. It'll announce itself as Android. If we go over to like an iPhone 6 Plus, it changes to that view with that resolution and such. And then if we were to visit websites in this view, it would announce itself with a user agent of iPhone. So we have these common devices. We can further edit the device list. And here's a bunch of other ones that are not active. If you want to test them, like if you want to go back in time and see what would this have looked like on a BlackBerry Playbook, whatever that is. So I can activate the BlackBerry Playbook, and then that'll now be a device selectable there. So Google Chrome is very cool because uh, they've really loaded it with features for websites and web apps, but also mobile app testing. And because we're going to focus a lot on Android development, we will further be able to use Google Chrome for more, more debugging and testing. So here, this little section is simply saying that if you added browser, if you did taco platform add browser to any project you're working on, you have the browser, which then is Google Chrome that loads it up like a device, not perfectly emulated. Couldn't do the splash screen, for example. And then we're able to test this on other devices see our console output, so when we write some JavaScript, any console.log output will show up there in the in Google Chrome console view. So this little section that I'm mentioning is very much for your information. I like to use this a lot, Taco Run Browser, so that we can see our project in the web browser. Even though it's going to be an iPhone app eventually, even though it's going to be an Android app, I like testing it in the browser. Um, recall then that back in my command prompt, it's sort of stuck. I did taco run, it did a bunch of processing, and then it's stuck right there. We're, we're in the browser. Taco is, or the command prompt is not ready for my next command. If I try to type more commands, it won't really let me. So I'm just reminding you here that you need to control C to cancel. And I say, type control C, it'll ask terminate batch, yes or no, I would press yes, or a faster way that I like to do is press control C and then press control C again since my hand's already there, and that'll automatically do the sort of yes. Because with yes I have to press the Y and then I have to press enter. If my hand's already at control C, I'll do control C, control C, and then I'm done. 
And recall that you can press the up arrow a couple of times to bring back your previous commands. So any questions on this little section here? Debugging Cordova browser and Google Chrome. This only works with Google Chrome. So if you don't have Chrome on your computer, if you've only got Safari or only Firefox or something else, you need Google Chrome for this to work. Okay, that's nice, but here's something else that's also very nice, debugging a real device with Google Chrome. This even works with a uh, virtual device. So if you have the ability, or you have the ability to use Google Chrome to help you debug your real device. The catch is you need a real device running Android 4.4 or higher. You can also use Chrome to debug an AVD. So in this case, I have a real device plugged in. In the command prompt, taco run android dash dash device. Obviously, if you don't have a real device set up at the moment, you cannot do this. So we'll just let me show you what it looks like. But if you do have a real device plugged in, a real android, taco run android device, that'll load up my project on my real device. And what I can then do in the Google Chrome developer screen, F12, I can go inspect the device. So let me wait for that to load up. It's loading up. But my handout says, once the project loads up, click the three dots. This is Customize and Control Dev Tools. The three dots up here, there's two three dots, but the one right here in your dev tools. Not the one at the full top right. Those are the options for Google Chrome itself. Here are sort of my options for developers. So as soon as my app loads up, or as soon as your app loads up, you click those dots. You'll have a menu of more tools, and then a sub-menu of inspect devices. All right, here we go. That's loading up. So in Google Chrome, I click the Dev Tools options. I have more tools. Inspect devices. Click Inspect devices. In my case, it does recognize that I've got my Moto E plugged in. It's connected. If I click, it shows here it's selected. It's compatible. It's green. If it's got another color, it may not be fully compatible with my device. I've currently got the com.jones.mysdce project running. It's still called Hello Taco. I guess, and index file. So if I choose to uh, click the inspect, and it pops up with a new window, and for some of you, you will be able to get a preview of what the device is running. For some of you, you will not get a preview of the device, but you will get a console. And also, depending on the device, some of you will also have the ability to control the device. There's nothing to really do here, but do you see there's a little circle that's like my finger? If I tap, you know, I'll be able to, once our app is real, I'll be able to, on Google Chrome, click to control my app. Just a Cordova compatible app. If I switch over to something else like Instagram, it'll say tab is inactive. It cannot control that. He can control a taco created project. And if I were, had things to click on and interact with, I would be able to do so with the mouse. And I would get console output. That's what this section is about here. I'm inspecting a real device. I'll get a device view on the left side, console at the right. 
I will be able to control my device if it's compatible. Uh, on the left side there, I'll be able to click and drag and all of that. Some things don't show up in that dev tools, like the keyboard. If I had an input and if I typed to, to start typing on my keyboard here, it would not show up on this screen over here. It would just be half empty because the keyboard is taking half the space. If I'm going to take a photo on the device, then the screen here will also become inactive because it cannot control the camera itself. And again, I show these two sections because I'm going to use them throughout the course as they are very useful for us to figure out why is my JavaScript not working? Why is that code I typed it right? Why doesn't it work? Well, we need to debug. And Google Chrome here will help us debug very quickly. This is similar to the Android device monitor, which we mentioned a while ago, but I just think this is much faster. It has less resources, and the cool thing is if it's compatible, it'll let you control your device. Usually when you rerun Taco Run Android, it'll lose focus on this screen, and I don't believe refreshing it will really wake it up, so usually if I have to recompile my app, I would close that dev screen, and I would simply select to inspect again from this device's screen. Those two sections are informational. We'll use them in, in a moment. But any questions on those two sections of handout 7? Okay, we're going to um, back up then to page 1 to do the first section. I'll explain this section in just a moment. The general idea is we've got this Cordova, this taco project that we created, and it's set up but it doesn't have the project our code from last month so we need to import our code from last month into this project when you got a copy of the of the project folder you want to double click it and then you want to double click ww folder right now the totality of this project is inside this www folder. It has various pieces. We're going to need to replace these pieces with the work of last month. But last month we used index.html and this month the project also has index.html. Index has some code that we don't want to lose and there's some code in the scripts folder that we don't want to lose and there's some code in the CSS folder we don't want to lose. So simply dragging and dropping last month's project into this month is going to have us lose some things. So my handout spells it out exactly what we need to do. First of all, inside of the project, we're going to rename index to index2, anything else, so that we don't lose it. Go ahead and rename your index file something else, such as index2. So then I have, from your mobile website folder, from part one of the class, copy every file inside of WW folder. Okay, so we need to go back over to our network folder. If you don't have a copy on your flash drive, go over to the network folder, to our class folder. And it's, uh, it's this top folder here. This is what we worked on last month. It's got last month's date. Everything in this folder, we need to copy it to the Cordova folder, the Taco project. So open the folder, select all of these files. I'm going to right click and copy all of those files.
and then in my flash drive where I've got my current project index 2. I'm going to copy all of those files from last month into this month's project. You can drag and drop, you can copy and paste. Maybe it'll say, well you already got an images folder, would you like to merge them? Yes, that'd be fine. Let that copy over. So what we finished with last month was all of that. I've copied it to this month. Go ahead, then you can close last month's folder. We've only got the project for this month. You should see if you copied it properly, you should see all of the files from last month. And from this month, we've got index 2, scripts, and CSS. OK. We will copy several lines of code from index 2 into index. Um, they're listed here. So I'm going to put this side by side to see it, hopefully. So I need to edit both. I need to open both the index and the index 2 HTML files. So you can select them both and then right click. Right-click, edit with Notepad++. Okay, so here in Notepad, I get uh, my index and my index 2. Index 2 is the placeholder index file. We haven't quite looked at it. Uh, the handout says what to do, but before we do that, I'll give us a little breakdown of what's in this file. We've just been working with Taco, but we haven't quite seen what this file is so much. It's got the usual HTML5 and all of that. It's missing the car set. But there's a line 8. We've talked about this uh, briefly, the content security policy. That's what will keep our app the most secure so that it doesn't load up malicious code. There's also a comment above that where you can follow that at some point to get more information about what the CSP is and how to manage it. Format detection, telephone no. I forget exactly what that does, but that's to make our app most compatible with mobile devices. I remember looking it up recently, but I forgot what it, what it did. We're going to need that line in a moment. MS application tap highlight content no. Well, this is a website. And on a normal website, you are able to tap and hold to select some text to copy it or whatever on a website. You don't really do that on an app. You load the Instagram app, and then you click buttons to post a photo or to add a comment. You don't really select text in an app unless it's specifically allowed to you. You know, I can't select the word Instagram from the Instagram header. So what this is saying is do not allow us to tap and highlight text like a real app. If you didn't want that, obviously we wouldn't use that meta tag. There's a viewport here which is very similar to the one we've used before. User scalable no, initial scale 100%. Um, uh, I think we also had maximum scale 100%. Now here's another one, minimum scale. So the minimum zoom of our project is 100. And then the width of the project is set to the device width. So our project will grow to fill the width of the screen either vertically or horizontally. So it's a slightly different viewport just so that our website fills up the whole screen. There's a reference to a style sheet that we won't need. Don't worry about that. T 
title, head, body, all of that, that's obvious. There's a div of a class and an ID of device ready, don't worry about that. And then there's some references to JavaScript. Line 21, a reference to Cordova.js library. If you look in the folder of the project, there is nothing here that says Cordova.js. That's okay. We don't need to have a file called Cordova in this folder. It automatically is created when we do taco run, or when we do taco build, or taco emulate. So we will need that line of code in a moment, but don't be confused if you don't see that file in the folder. Uh, scripts index. This is an index file of JavaScript to make this basic project work. We don't really need it. Most of the things in there, but we'll look at it in a moment. And then we've got platform overrides. If we were going to target multiple devices, we can write JavaScript that is targeted to each device. We're going to write JavaScript for all devices, but if we wanted to have only certain code that only works on an iPhone, or code that only works on an Android, we have platform overrides. This will override the JavaScript per platform. In general, that's what's in this index file. That's what this is, this basic Cordova welcome screen. And what my handout says is we need... We're going to copy the, the meta tags of the content security policy, the format detection, the MS app tap highlight, and the viewport. We're going to copy those three lines of code. I would recommend, I didn't put it in the handout, but I would recommend to also copy the comment just so that you can refer to it later on because we're going to lose this index file eventually. We're going to delete it. It has things we don't need. I would recommend start on line 4 and select all the way to line 12 and copy that. We're going to go then to our new index file of our work from last month. And we're going to paste this. I'm going to create a brand new line 5 after our car set. So at the end of line 4, new line, I'm going to paste in that chunk. You can change your alignment if you'd like. taking the code from our template and putting it into our real project. And I need to take away the old viewport, line 14. The viewport meta tag that we're bringing from our template is a little better. So in my case, line 14, I'm going to delete it. Make sure you're deleting the old viewport. I just paste it in a new viewport, delete the old viewport. Okay, so then we need to copy, as I said, in the index 2, there is a reference over to cordova.js. We need that line of code. So back on the index file. On line 21, I'm going to need to copy line 21. Copy line 21. And my handout says, and it's in red here, place this below blah 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 jQuery.js. It's very easy to paste this right after your uh, jQuery mobile CSS file. Things may work, but in our case, we definitely want this the Cordova.js reference below the jQuery JS file. 
that's very far down in our project. If we if we look at our index, uh, going all the way down, it's near 328. So in the index file from last month, I'm all the way in line 328. I'll paste in the reference to Cordova. It's in this order because it does matter. First, we're, we're loading up jQuery, the basic jQuery library, which has a variety of features. On top of that, we put jQuery mobile, which gives us mobile-friendly features based on jQuery. Then, on top of that, we load Cordova. And Cordova has things that reference and use jQuery, so it's there. And then we have our own external Codeca.js file, which will be our custom code that we will use after all of those other base libraries load. This is completely optional, and I don't have it in the handout. I am going to delete the part that says the type attribute. Just simply leave it as source. It doesn't matter if you do that. But the reason I did that is it's not necessary in HTML5. HTML5 assumes that when we're using the script tag, it's JavaScript, not CGI, not ASP, etc. It, is, it assumes it's JavaScript. And just because I don't use it anywhere else, it looks out of place to me, so I'm going to delete it. And it also saves us a few bytes in our program, which may or may not matter, but I like the consistency of how that simply looks. It still works the same, but we don't really need the, the uh, definition that this is JavaScript. It's assumed in HTML5. to my handout. So I copied that JavaScript into the right spot. I need to remove a couple of items. Going back to the top of the document, lines 15 and 16. We don't need those two anymore. These meta tags regarding Apple devices, we don't need those anymore. This is still going to be an iPhone compatible project, but these two meta tags were from a time where it was assumed that our project would only be a website. This is no longer relevant once we are going to create a real iPhone app, a real Android app, so we don't need lines 15 and 16 anymore. So I'll remove them completely. I have a note here, which you can do later, because this will get us off track a bit. Tonight, number six, do the same for your map screen. I forgot to rename it. We're calling it map.html. I'm saying here the dir html. In, in your project last month, we had a, 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 the screen to show the map, map.html. So you'll need to do what we just did to there. We won't do it. I'm going to move on to number seven. But you need to make yourself a note. At some point, you need to go to your map HTML and copy the same lines of code into map HTML. That was number six. So I so I'll do it later. You can do that later. I'm gonna save in Notepad. I'm gonna save my index file and close it. And I'm going to close index 2. You don't have to save it. It doesn't matter. So I'm going to close index 2. So I dealt with my index file. I copied over some lines from the template into my current project. Now I need to do something similar in the CSS file and in the JavaScript file. We'll do the CSS file first. So what we need to do is open the from the CSS folder, we'll open index.css in Notepad, and then we'll also open kodika.external.css file. We're going to open both of those files now. So in the project folder, 
CSS folder. We're going to right click to edit with notepad index.css. I'm going to minimize that for a moment and go back to my folder and then also open codica.external.css in notepad as well. So both the CSS files I'm opening up, one from the old template file and one from my current project. So what's inside of the index CSS file, the template project? There's a few CSS rules. There is first the body tag that defines basic features of the project. There are these WebKit touch callout, WebKit text size, WebKit user select. Okay, so what these are doing is these are preventing, for example, prevent callout to copy image, etc., when tap to hold. So this is another way to prevent our project from behaving like a website. It's no longer a website. So by saying no longer allowing tap and hold to select, that's that, no longer allowing us to resize the text, we've already set it in that meta tag for viewport. And not, not selecting the other way here, I've also copy paste and all of that. Prevent copy paste. If you do want to allow copy and paste, you can change none to text. If you do want people to be able to copy and paste from inside the app, you can set that to text. There's a basic background color that is set behind the scenes. I don't know what that color is, but based on our config file, F uh, AA22 FF. I guess I have that in there. AA22 FF. Okay. So if you'd like to, you can change this. Doesn't matter. AA22 FF. Background color pound AA22FF. Font family. Uh, try to use the Roboto regular font in our project. If that font is not available for the device, next choice is try to use Droid Sans. If that font is not available on, their, on our device, third choice is Sego so UI. If that one's not available, next, 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 down the line. And all of those are common fonts for different platforms. These two of Roboto and Droid are Android specific fonts, the default Android font. Uh, Droid Sans is like Android 1.0 to 3.0 or something, and Roboto is 4.0 and up. So later on, we will be able to choose any custom font we want but it's going to be in this sort of method. For the moment, it's just going to choose the appropriate default Android font. The next one's over here. These are Windows. Segoe UI and Segoe are Windows fonts. So if I'm running my project on a Windows device, it'll try to use those fonts. Um, Segoe UI, I think, is Windows 10, and Segoe is Windows 8. Then we've got San Francisco, Helvetica New, and Helvetica. Those are Mac fonts. Well, at least San Francisco and Helvetica new. Those are those are iOS fonts. So if this project is running on an on an iOS device, iPhone, iPad, it'll try to use San Francisco. If that's not available, it'll then try to use Helvetica. And again, San Francisco is like iOS, uh, I don't know, 8.0 and up, and Helvetica new is seven to one or something. Well, if none of those platform-specific fonts are available, then we have so much more generic fonts. Helvetica, probably everyone has Helvetica, every device. If not, okay, everyone probably has Arial. If not, everyone probably has Geneva. If not, the lowest common denominator that everyone has is Sans Serif, which is just a plain old basic font. Show a basic font. That's the final fallback right there. Later on, I'll show you how you can customize it to have 
completely different fonts, cool calligraphy fonts and all of that, but that's a lesson for another day. But this is how we specify fonts with a font family. Font size, we've got a basic font size for our project. I'm not quite sure why they chose 12 pixels. I would not recommend that at all. We don't want to use hard values. We don't want to use absolute values of pixels. We want to use values of either percentages or M's. So if we were to set this to 100%, the font size would go to the default size of the device. We often also see them in units of M, which is 1M is like 100%. 1 0.75 m is like 175 percent. So whatever units you want to use here, I would recommend 105 percent. Make the fonts slightly larger than normal because the text on these devices is often a little smaller than we might like. So all of this affects basic aspects of the app body. The body tag is edited thus. Everything else in the code here is not really necessary. This is just for our placeholder app. Our Cordova placeholder. There's app, and that's where the Cordova mascot icon is coming from. We're not going to use that. Don't worry. This is being aligned to the center of the screen. We don't need any of that. So don't worry about this class event. Don't worry about that either. That's from code that we're not going to use anymore. Event ready. Again, don't worry. Keyframe to fade. Here's some animation right here. We're not really going to animate things. That's what's causing that animation to happen of device ready. How it's glowing. It's happening here. There's a fade. It's going from full 100% view, 50% through the animation, the opacity of the color is 40%, and it goes back to full visible, 100% visible. So that little blue, or that little green icon, or device ready, never fades out completely to black. It fades out at the most to 40%. And another way to, to say it, WebKit frames fade. But again, we're not even going to use that, so don't worry about those. The last items could be useful. This is these are media queries. This is CSS checking, in this case, orientation. If the app is in portrait orientation, we can write then here a variety of CSS rules to do a variety of things styling. If the device goes landscape, we could change that. So we can have a certain background color when the app is portrait, and we can have a certain background color if the app is landscape. Now remind me, why does this not matter for us at the moment? Landscape or portrait styling. Well, I think I heard someone say, because we have our app locked to portrait. In the config XML file, we have the app locked to portrait. So we're never going to get it into landscape. It's locked to portrait. So in our case, then these two lines here wouldn't do anything. I think they might be useful for future projects, so that I don't forget that they exist. Maybe I'll copy them. But this was just a quick explanation of what was in the index.css file, and my handout says we're going to copy. We really only need copy everything that's in the body block, so the curly brace to curly brace. We're going to copy that, and then we're going to paste it into our Codica CSS file at the very top. Now this is, this is optional for you to also get these portrait and landscape things. So at the minimum, I'm going to select lines 1 to 8, In the index file. Copy those lines. Don't forget the curly brace of body. 
and then into my Kodika extra or external. Uh, I don't need that line one anymore. I know I'm putting custom code here. I'll delete that. But at the very top, I will paste in that body code. As I said, we're not going to bother with a landscape or portrait orientation, but maybe you can copy lines 51 to 57 and paste them at the very end of your Kodika code. And maybe one day, when you have free time, you can experiment with that and see how cool it is to easily be able to style your app portrait or landscape with those media queries. So I'm going to go to the very end of my code, paste that in. And so the only thing I needed was body from the index CSS file. I'm gonna close I'm gonna save my Kodika CSS file and close it. You don't have to save the original index CSS file. I'm gonna close it and not save it. That was number seven here. We've copied some code from the CSS file, the old one and paste it into the new one. Now, lastly, we'll do something like that for the index.js file. So while I'm here, I'm going to open in uh, kodika.external.js in Notepad. Minimize that, and then go into the scripts folder. Edit the index.js file. So I've opened index.js and Kodika external. We'll take a quick overview of what's in this index.js file. We will not need everything about it. The very first line is an anonymous function. This is very common practice to do when dealing with advanced JavaScript. JavaScript you can define many variables that are global scope, local scope. You can define various functions that are local scope, global scope, etc. You can have naming conflicts. You can have problems with hoisting your order of operations and all this complex stuff. So one modern way that user that developers use JavaScript in a web app or in mobile app is by using an anonymous function syntax like this. Let me, let me just write this to break it down. This is basically set up like this. I'll write it all on one line so that it's readable. You don't have to write this. But that's what this is. This one line here, it starts off curly braces broken, several lines of code, curly brace ends, parenthesis ends, and then function runs. So that's the syntax that is very common to see in modern advanced JavaScript. We haven't had to use it, but we should now as we will get more complex. This helps define our namespace, preventing conflicts with our functions and um, for efficiency purposes. That's what that looks like all simplified. But you see that starts on line 1, goes to line 25. Then, that means every JavaScript that we will subsequently write must be inside of this anonymous function. You could technically write JavaScript outside of it. You should not. The whole point of using this anonymous function is for more safety, that your code runs more properly. So we're always going to write, we're always going to write our JavaScript in the anonymous function. One thing we have not seen before in this class also is this flag right here, use strict. We're going to use strict mode of JavaScript. Sometimes we get silent errors. Sometimes we're writing the code properly. And technically there was an error, but the debugger won't tell you. So here, use strict will force more errors to appear. And that's good. I want 
to be aware of any possible errors that I might get, so we're going to use strict mode in our JavaScript. There's an event listener here. The document object add event listener. We're waiting for an event. The object of the document, the whole website, the whole project, basically. There's an event. We're waiting for an event to happen. Events are things like clicking a button, uh, when the battery drops down to a certain level, if I orient my phone, all of those are events. There's an event that's happening. So we're listening, we're waiting for an event, specifically the device ready event. Uh, Cordova, Taco, emits an event of device ready when the project is ready to run, when all the Cordova code has loaded and is ready. So we're waiting for that device ready event. When that device ready event fires, we then run the on device ready function, binding this to it. And in the syntax, we usually just have a false at the end. Don't worry about that. It's almost always false. So we're saying if the Cordova code is ready, then let us run the on device ready function, which is right here. Function definition on device ready. Any Cordova code, Cordova specific code that we run and we'll be using a lot, then should be inside of on device ready. We've done that previously here. Navigator.splashscreen.hide. That's Cordova code. That only makes sense if we have Cordova.js library. Therefore, try not to use the, cor the this Cordova code until the device is ready. So by doing this event listener, we guarantee that none of our Cordova code will fail because it will only run until on device ready has been invoked. So most of the time we're going to be writing our code throughout the rest of the class in this on device ready function. Let's do one thing here, line 8. Let's write a console log output. We'll say Cordova is ready. So in theory, what will happen here is when the device is ready, the splash screen will hide, and then in the console, I will get a note, Cordova is ready. This is JavaScript, so we can write comments and such. Maybe you can write comments if necessary. Lines 11 and 12. We've got some more event listeners. To the document, let's wait for something. Let's wait for a pause event. Yes. The user? Yes, in a sense that you will get more output, uh, especially errors. Exactly. Anything that's console output, uh, me, the developer, would see that. Even if I don't do console log output, the user would not see any of this either. It's, uh, it's pretty protected. Okay, so a couple more event listeners here, this time pause. So there's going to be an event that when I'm in my project, I go back to the home screen, behind the scenes, a pause event was fired. My app told the system, pause. So right here, if there was a pause event, then run the on pause function. On pause says to do. This application has been suspended, save app state here, or something. So when you exit the app, have it do something behind the scenes. The pause event was fired. We have a function there that we can then do something there, like if we're playing a game, 
pause the timer, save the score at the moment, because who knows then when the user will come back. And as other memory gets used up, maybe the memory we had in that app goes away. Well, if we had on pause, we can save that temporarily. Eventually, then, if I return to my app, so if I bring my app back, now at that moment, it fired resume. So the resume event was emitted. The app sent out this, the alert resume. And so here we've, we're waiting for that. If that happens, then run on resume. And on resume is still also a to-do. Nothing is there. But what I could do then here is, well, if I've saved data temporarily, load that data again and bring us back to the point we were at. Again, the high score. Start the timer again. We don't want the timer to keep going while the person is out of the app. So restart, resume the timer, load up other variables or whatever, and then our app is running again. So we have pause and we have resume. There's a few more that we can look up. What other events do we have? We can go to the Cordova website and look them all up. There's device ready, there's pause, there's resume, there's volume up, volume down. We can say, well, if someone presses volume up, have it do something. If someone presses the power button, have it do something else. Those are events that Cordova can tap into, and they're all defined on the documentation. And then these items right here, 14 to 17, we don't need them at all. We're going to remove them eventually. But that is what's causing the, uh, the glowing effect to happen. Uh, in the index file, index 2, there was an, event, there was an element of device ready. When that element, when, that, uh, when we get into the on device ready, well, to that element, we're going to change the text, inner.html, we're going to change the text that said, whatever it said, waiting for the device, we're going to change that to say device ready. And then what we're going to do is add a class of ready, and in the CSS file, that class simply turned the color to green. The color of wait for device used to be gray, but when the device is ready, change that to green, change the text to device ready, and the app is ready. We will not need that at all in our project. So that's a quick overview of what was it what's in a standard default taco project, the JS file. What we need to do is we need to copy everything in that file, the JS file. We're going to copy the whole thing and then we're going to paste it at the very top of the codica.external.js file. So all 27 lines of this code 26, 27, whatever you have. All the lines of the Kogika.js file, copy that. I mean, all the lines of the index file. I'm copying all the lines of the index file, and now I'm going to my Kogika.js file, and I'll give myself some space, lots of space here, just so that I don't lose track of it. And I'm going to paste everything that was in the index file into Kodika. here. Copy everything, paste it at the top. We don't need the index file JS anymore. If you had any pre-existing JavaScript code, make sure it's inside function on device ready. We'll do that in a moment. And then we'll also have to remove lines 12 to 16, it may vary. It's the part that says that var element element class name. So before I incorporate my old code, what I mean here is this is what we don't need from the template. We don't need that comment here. Code was loaded. Great. We don't need to create that var. We don't need to set that element property or the class name. Let's delete that. But not the curly brace, of course, of on device ready. So that's what we need there. Our on device ready function has been simplified a bit. If you had any pre-existing JavaScript code, which we do, make sure we move it to inside function on device ready. So we had written some code already.
all of this other code. We, we wrote all of that code for saving the user's name and all of that. So let's see here. We don't need that. Put your custom code here anymore. So I'm going to select all of the code from previous all the way down, right, from your jQuery selector of the button. Select that all the way down to show name function. Cut that so that we can move it anywhere inside of on device ready. I'm going to paste that in and we might have to sort of tab that to look a little nicer. So all the previously existing code worked just fine but now it should work inside of on device ready. On device ready runs when our device is ready, thanks to Cordova. This is when we're getting lots of code, so I'm going to put some comments on approximately line 51. That's the ending curly brace of on device ready. Near it is on pause, near that is on resume. So on line 51, space that slash slash end on device ready. This is a the device ready is already getting a little long. And as I scan through my code, I'm gonna forget what is that curly brace there again for? Well, that's the end of my on device ready function. This is optional, but it's very useful to explain your code. And the double slash is a single line comment. So starting from there to the rest of the line, that's a comment. Well, we're putting a, well, while we're here putting a couple of comments, on my line 42, I have function show name. It's not a very big function, but I'm going to do the same thing there. I'm going to lose track of these curly braces very easily. So that ending curly brace, and I know it's ending because if you click on it, it highlights its pair. That's my end show name function. So at approximately line 48, if your line numbers don't line up, that's OK. Just try to find where I'm talking about. This comment here, it's just a marker for me. It's not a very big function, I'm not going to lose track. But I will lose track of the previous function in a moment. That's the end of my show name function. If I back up, there's a curly brace right before the start of show name function. If I follow that curly brace, that is my get name function. So that's end of get name. I'm using the default color scheme so I can easily see green stand out. If you're in any other color, screen, color scheme, the comments may be a different kind of color. But here in the default color scheme, I like that it's nice and green and it stands out very quickly because then I can see these notes. And as these lines get longer, as these functions get more complex, and I have a whole screen full, but it's still not enough to see everything, little comments like this hopefully help me to understand my code, to not lose track of my code. I'm going to save that codica.external.js file and I'm going to close it. I'm going to close the original index file. You don't have to save that one. Back to my notes. Copy everything. Oh, we already did this. In the first line inside of function on device ready, add console.log, Cordova is ready. We already did that. Great. Okay, so now we've integrated last month's code into this month's project. And therefore, we have some vestigial files 
and folders. We no longer need that index2 file. We could leave it and it'll exist peacefully there. It's not really doing anything, but maybe to save up a little bit of bytes and kilobytes, I'm going to remove it. The CSS folder, we're not even going to have a reference to that CSS file at all anymore. We've already got the appropriate CSS code in Kodika CSS, so we don't even need that CSS folder anymore. And in the scripts folder, well, we've got a reference over to the JavaScript libraries that we need, therefore we no longer need that scripts folder. So following my instructions here, backing up here, I no longer need the CSS <coughs> folder, the scripts folder, and the index2 file. Very careful, the index2 file. I don't need those three anymore, I can delete. And remember, even if you delete your stuff, I'm putting my folders, my projects at the end of the, the day, I'm putting my code into the network folder, you can get a copy of it. Last time stuff is in there, so if you ever lose something from the project, it's still going to be in the network folder in there somewhere. I will delete that. And to see the, the fruits of my labor, command prompt. Now you can do either taco run browser or taco run Android or taco emulate. Android. Now, go take a look at your project. The most impressive, of course, is on a real device. I'm going to do taco run Android device. And here's a trick. You can, you can run more than one command in sequence in the command prompt. I'm going to I'm going to want it to run in the device, and then I also want it to run in the browser. So if I do space ampersand ampersand space, then it'll execute another command right after the first command. Don't do taco run browser and then taco run Android, because it's going to get stuck on the browser, remember. But what you could do here is chain it. To get really impressive, you could do taco, emulate, android, and, and, taco run device, and taco run browser. So it's going to first compile it and run it in my emulator, and then right afterwards, without my feedback, it'll then run it in my device, and then right after that, it'll run it in the browser, and then it'll get stuck, because it gets stuck on the browser. Now I'm not going to do all three of those. It takes too long to emulate, but I will run it on my device and my browser. Hit that, and so it'll run the first command, compile to device, and then automatically go to the second, compile, go to the browser. I'm going to take a break very soon, but I want to test. Did my project from last month come into this month's project, and does it behave like it's supposed to? There may be a couple rough around the edges things that we'll get to, of course, but I want to see finally my project from last month as a real app. Remember the whole allure of the class is we're going to learn web languages to create real apps. And last month we created a website, which is nice but not as impressive as a real app. Well, it's going to be a real app now. It will be a real app because as long as you have HTML code in the WW folder and you do what we're doing here, it's a real app. So here we go, we've got the MySTC icon loading, and there that is. From last month, I've got my project, and I'm going window to window, loading up these screens, nice and responsive. Calendar, cool. Rough around the edges thing are the catalog. We're going to fix that in a moment. I we did not do the map screen, so that's probably going to look pretty weird. But I'll load the map screen. Directions, yeah, it looks all weird and purple. Kind of loads up. It does seem to be showing a real location. Cool, so it is showing me here on campus. Get directions. Well, that worked. It said take a big U-turn. So it says go out and come back in, and you'll be here. That's working. Cool. I can drop a little man onto the street there. And look, it's even there. What's that? Let me try that right now and see how that's working. So my map is working pretty well, kind of. 
We need to personalize. Click on that. I do get the pop up that says enter name. I'm then going to put a name. Click OK on that. Close that. To say welcome, Victor, I'm going to exit my app completely. I'm going to force quit my app completely. I'm going to launch my app from my apps. There's my new app icon. Launch that. Splash screen. Two seconds. Welcome, Victor. So should. Here it loaded up on my web browser. As I said before, F12 to open it in the developer's view in a device view. So I've got it on the Galaxy S5 view, I've got it in the iPhone view, etc. I'm going to go to Art, Computers, etc. Calendar, open these things. Catalog doesn't quite work, I'm not going to click on it. You could if you want to. About, Personalize, Personalize it saying, welcome, Johnny Quest. So it is saving names, the map. That's the one that's kind of a little weird. Allow location in the browser. We'll say allow. Kind of working on the browser, but not fully. It is giving me a location in downtown, which I think is where the college's data center is at. It is, a, it is saying it's uh, no key. So get directions. Oh, that one kind of worked, I guess. So directions from downtown up to here. 10 miles. It's kind of working. All right, so it's getting there. We, we brought last month's project into this one. Oh, and if you also look on the console output here, Cordova is ready. So I'm getting console output. I'm going to clear that console. And to further reiterate my handout, I'll go to the Chrome Inspect Devices on my device. I'm running the My SDCE app. I will inspect that. This loads up a live view of my real device. There's the code over ready. This is my real device right here, and I'm able to control it via the web browser. It's a little choppier on my web browser, but it goes nicely on the actual device. And so if your device is compatible, you will be able to show off like this too. And where it doesn't quite work is if I go to Personalize, I click Personalize, and I get the alert here, but not on the browser. Click OK on that. Brings my focus back. And that says Welcome Bill. The map. See, it gets all purple for a moment. That's my background color. And then, because it is accessing the GPS of my device, it is showing. There's the map. Now, on my device, I see the little red pin, but in the browser, I don't. That's okay. I see that it's here. I click Get Directions, and like I said, because this does have a GPS chip, it works. On my device, there's a little blue line that says a U-turn, but on the browser, it doesn't. But it does have the directions. It says, head west on Arrow Drive toward Arrow Court, turn right on Arrow Court, and then turn right on Arrow Drive, and we're back. So that is looping. What happens if I grab the little person and put him on the street? Oh, there we go. So I can see street view there. I'm getting some feedback here. Blink deferred task. These are just warnings rather than errors. Okay, so if you've got a compatible device, you are able to control it from the browser, but more importantly, you will be able to see console output. Oh, I saw that right here. If I go back over to 
the about screen and I hit uh, personalize console output we clicked again we did that a long time ago when we were setting up the personalization screen just to check that we our buttons would work so if I cancel that we did console output a while ago about no name saved I canceled saving the name or I click the button it clicked again canceled canceled so we're gonna be able to see console output in the web browser to debug this yes do you have do you are you connected to our Wi-Fi on our device do you have location turned on on your device okay I'll check you in one moment um, that's good to see different perspectives of what works what doesn't but we're seeing different ways that it works and I'll check in the break in a moment oh okay so okay perfect time for a break if it worked great if not we'll take a little break and I'll help you out hopefully then you're able to bring in your app and then when we come back we'll look at the second half of the sheet I'll turn the printer back on if you'd like that and uh, we're getting closer and closer to working on this project to make it to fulfill the promise of a real app it technically is a real app now right we've been seeing Cordova is a real app and now we took our project from last month and it's a real app wrapped around Cordova at 7.33, we'll be back at 7.45, and then we'll go on.